it's seven o'clock. Um, let's get started. We'll start on time. Um, we always try to end conservation cafes on time as well. Uh, everything is a new world here today though, so we will just do our best with all things. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. So far we have on uh, 33 attendees plus our panelists. Thank you so much for joining. And we did reach our maximum registration, so we expect that more people will come in and join us. Uh, I've left some written notes on the instructions I'm about to give everyone so that uh, people who are playing catch up can see them in the chat box. But I'll start out by introducing myself. I'm Eliza Kava. I'm the Director of Conservation at Audubon Naturalist Society. And I'm normal, I've been the host of our Conservation Cafe series for the last three years. Um, but in the last couple of months, our new conservation advocates, uh, Renee Grieve in Northern Virginia, and also Denise Guitara in Maryland, and Ari Eisenstadt in DC, and Denise and Ari are helping us behind the scenes today, have uh, taken over on host planning and hosting these conservation cafes. So this is not only a new format for us, it was going to be in a new location, and now it's in an even newer location online. So we thank all of you for your uh, patience and joining us as we work through this and we've practiced a lot we're going to do great but if there's a small glitch in the system please forgive us in advance um, so audubon naturalist society is the dc region's oldest independent environmental organization we're headquartered at wood end nature sanctuary in chevy chase which is still open for visiting at a six foot distance by the way right now and also our rust sanctuary in leesburg is similar the grounds are open the buildings are closed uh, and so we welcome you to go and take a, a lovely walk there with your family unit. And we serve the whole DC region and we protect nature, we protect people's access to nature and human health. Um, we have a long history working on water quality, but we do so much more and we focus on equity uh, and we have a, a, a really significant environmental education program. Uh, the conservation cafes are meant to bring together conservation experts and let people learn from them about what's, what they're doing and what you can do. So thank you all for joining us uh, for some really great and exciting learning with our fantastic panel. Um, with the coronavirus, we're shifting to online. And we also, I wanna acknowledge it's a stressful time. We hope that everyone is staying safe with your families. Um, thank you for taking the time with us. And again, this is our first virtual event. So um, it's all in uh, context here because of this crisis that we're in together. Um, we will be recording this event, we already are, and we will circulate the link to it uh, afterwards, as well as our slides and contact information. So you'll be able to uh, re-watch this or share it with others. It will be hosted on the Audubon Naturalist Society's YouTube page. Okay, logistics, a couple of quick logistics. If you, um, if you look, you have the access to a chat function, and you also have a Q&A function. Uh, you can use the chat function to sort of share observations, comments. There might be a, a, an example where a panelist asks you to put something in the chat uh, window in response to something they say. That's sort of for, for attendees to share with one another. Do not expect that the panelists will be reading the chat window in real time. They have too much else to concentrate on. Uh, however, we will record that and have it available uh, so that we can use it for evaluations afterwards. Then there's a Q&A button. If you have a question that you would like our moderator, Eleanor Hodges, to ask of one of the panelists, please put it in the Q&A box. And also, you might want to keep the Q&A box open or check it from time to time, because we expect we'll get many more questions than the panelists actually will have time to answer. And you can upvote your favorites, the ones that you're interested in as well, so that Eleanor can use that information to help her decide what to ask given the limited time available. Um, and of course, if someone has already asked a similar question as the one you want to ask, you can upvote that. You can see other attendees' questions if you change your default view to see all questions versus my questions only, okay? Um, and um, again, you can also, you also have the option to send a question anonymously as you're putting it in. You can upvote by pushing the thumbs up button on somebody else's question, by the way. So um, again, we, won't, we know we won't get to all questions. If we are able to, we are doing our best to answer them afterwards and pass that information on to all attendees. Again, feel free to interact with the other attendees in the chat window, but don't expect the panelists will be able to review what you put in the chat window uh, on any routine basis. Finally, if you're joining by phone, then you can email me directly, eliza.cava, E-L-I-Z-A dot C-A-V-A at anshome.org. That's eliza.cava at anshome.org. And I can make sure your question gets added to the Q&A window for Eleanor to look at. And with that, 
Thank you. Welcome. I turn it over to Eleanor. Great. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Eliza. My name is Eleanor Hodges. I'm the Executive Director of EcoAction Arlington, and welcome to the Nova Conservation Cafe. Um, so we are here tonight with an amazing group of panelists, and it is clearly a sign of exciting changes here in Virginia that each of these panelists today is either in a position that is brand new or recently expanded. So welcome to all our panelists. The theme for today's event is a sustainable Northern Virginia community, and we're excited to hear from these panelists as well as you, our cafe participants. Uh, before we start, uh, we would like to acknowledge elected official delegate Kay Corey, who represents the 38th District of Virginia. We very much appreciate Delegate Corey and our staff registering for this event. Uh, delegate Corey, are you or your staff here? Well, again, thank you for your interest. So I want to start with an overview of tonight's agenda. Um, so we're going to start having each of the panelists introduce themselves. Um, we then um, will have polls for you, the audience, and we'll be sprinkling those polls throughout the event. We uh, will have some set questions for each of the panelists that I will be asking, and then we'll open it up to about 45 minutes of question and answers from the audience, which you, which you should put in the Q&A, as Eliza indicated. And at the end, we have a final wrap-up question for each of the panelists and a poll. So I'm now going to turn it over to each of the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, let's start with uh, Sonia, who is from the Coalition for Smarter Growth. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. My name is Sonia Brihi. Uh, I am the Coalition for Smarter Growth's new, uh, it's funny, I believe I'm sharing my screen, but I will be honest, it's hard to tell. Great, thank you. Um, the coalition from smarter growth is a small but mighty team we have six people on staff and we focus on the interconnected issues of land use transportation and in the environment around the dc region and with the addition of my new position here in northern virginia we've been able to expand our capacity here promoting a vision of walkable bikeable mixed use mixed income transit oriented communities so sprawling development presents significant challenges to sustainability in Fairfax. The places people need to go are too spread out to be walkable or to make transit viable. Cars are needed for most trips. So with transportation the largest contributor of carbon pollution in the US, this is unsustainable. We need better land use linked to transit, walking, and bicycling. And this is what the coalition does, because we know there is a better, more sustainable way to grow. CSG developed a blueprint for a better region that advocates for focusing growth into transit-oriented communities, or TOD, transit-oriented development. In Fairfax, that's along the metro line, as well as major commercial corridors that you can see mapped out here uh, on the screen. We can develop these areas into communities that have access to reliable transit, safe streets for walking and biking, and mixed income housing options. 10% of Fairfax County's land could support TOD and absorb population growth without continuing to sprawl outward. These are areas near Metro like Dunloring, Reston, West Falls Church, and older commercial areas that enhanced, uh, where enhanced transit is viable, like Seven Corners, Bailey's Crossroads, and the Richmond Highway Corridor. Redevelopment like this also offers the opportunity to update stormwater control so that newer standards helping to better control runoff and restore the health of our streams can be implemented. So the Coalition for Smarter Growth played a key role in advancing TOD in Tyson's and supporting the new Silver Line. And now we're seeing Tyson's transforming itself into more walkable transit oriented place. And this is just a quick introduction to the work we do and how we will be able to create a more sustainable, equitable Northern Virginia. And I'm Glad to be here to share this with you and to be a part of making this uh, happen in Northern Virginia. Thanks. Great. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Renee. Well, welcome everybody. You heard a little bit about the Audubon Naturalist Society from Eliza's intro. And as she mentioned, we're the oldest, uh, DC area's oldest independent environmental organization founded 123 years ago. And we work to connect people back with their natural environment and inspire them, inspire them to be advocates for that nature. 
So in terms of our broader organization, as Eliza mentioned, Wood End Sanctuary is our headquarters up in Chevy Chase, Maryland, where we have so many resources. We have a great headquarters, a demonstration landscape, um, camp and educational programs, and more. And then as she also mentioned, we have Rest Sanctuary that we own in Leesburg, but it's operated by Nova Parks and the grounds actually are closed during this time right now. Um, and so when you think about my position as the new Northern Virginia conservation advocate, it was upgraded to a full-time position last year from a part-time position. And it's my job to leverage our ANS resources, our history and our experiences to partner with other NOVA organizations to support our NOVA campaigns and outreach. So I do that primarily in Fairfax County and also in Loudoun County, along with all the adjacent locales that might be there, the, the smaller cities and smaller counties as well. One example of a longer term focus of ours has been the involvement in the Embark Richmond Highway Redevelopment Project Comp Plan Amendment and the resulting redevelopment of that. Redevelopment is really a perfect opportunity to engage the public early, often, and over the long term you know, on the many intersecting issues that come up during a large scale initiative like this. And you know, from an environmental equity standpoint, affordable housing, water quality, and many, many more things. And it also allows us to partner with a high diversity of organizations in the area to help raise the capacity of all of our organizations and to raise all of our voices in a stronger, united way as well. We'll hear about more of that later. Um, we also do more place-specific um, work as opportunities present themselves, particularly in precedent-setting ones, like this one from our 2018-19, where uh, we helped to hold off a development along the Doge Creek uh, watershed and um, you know, had some great successes there partnering with organizations as well. So as we get into the Q&A portion, we'll talk more about partnerships and the work as well. Wonderful. Our next panelist is Bridget, who represents the Virginia Conservation League of Voters. Hi, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen really quick. All right, so hi, um, my name is Bridget McGregor and I actually live in the Fredericksburg area about an hour south of Northern Virginia. Um, I work as an organizer for Virginia LCV and I've been in this position for about a year now. So the Virginia League of Conservation Voters, um, let me try and go to the next slide, there we go. So the Virginia League of Conservation Voters essentially serves as the political voice of the state's conservation community. Our main focus is to make sure that Virginia's elected officials, Protect Virginia's environment and then also to help elect conservation leaders into office and this past year in November was pretty much the first time we've been able to succeed in that along with a lot of other organizations trying to do the same things so that was really exciting um, we also work to put good public policies in place on a state level and also to hold elected officials accountable for their positions on the environment um, each year we come out with a scorecard and um, give that to the public so that they can see what their local elected officials have been voting for and voting against and then it rates them on a 100% scale on um, how many things that they vote for that are supporting the environment. So um, this past year, a few of our main focuses have been um, surrounding carbon reduction, clean energy, banning offshore drilling, and also um, the elections that happened this past November that I mentioned. So we'll go into a little bit more details on that in the upcoming questions. Um, so in my role as organizer, my work pretty much takes me everywhere from um, Richmond to Loudoun, Northern Virginia area, and also in Fredericksburg. And here's my little um, homemade map showing the different areas that we pretty much cover. So right now, our home base is pretty much in Richmond. We also have a field team that works in the Virginia Beach area, um, a field team that works in the Richmond area and a Richmond organizer. And then I cover the Fredericksburg, um, pretty much Northern Virginia area and up to Loudoun. Um, so pretty much in my job, I get the opportunity to connect with community members across all of these areas. And then I also, pre I work to support and educate people on different environmental issues that we focus on at LCV, and then also look for ways that we can help support local efforts throughout these different areas. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Rebecca with the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions. Hi, I'm Rebecca Mordini, and let me get you to screen share. Hi, I'm Rebecca Mordini. I was hired just at the end of January as the Advocacy and Community Engagement Manager for the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions. 
while this position isn't new, it was recently expanded just a bit to include um, the advocacy portion. Mm -hmm. Of course, I would be the one who misses the slide. <laughs> Facts believe that climate change is the moral and ethical issue of our time. We unite people of faith to develop local equitable solutions to the climate crisis. And we do that through both advocacy and working uh, and in community organizations. We work with over 75 faith communities and we were founded in 2013. And our network includes faiths, all different faiths in the Northern Virginia area. When I first started, I was really surprised to see that almost every faith has some type of earth care or creation care. The FACTS Advocacy Program is hyper-local. It is, while our community outreach is throughout Northern Virginia, our advocacy is in Fairfax County. And we also work on related Virginia legislation. In each of the nine districts, we have a district advocacy team. So what we do is we train constituents from that district to talk about some of our key issues. And this year they include more solar, tree canopy, compost, and energy efficiency. There's a lot more to it. We attend meetings um, and testify at hearings and hold forums and workshops. We have campaigns, letter writing campaigns, et cetera. And we'll get to talk a little bit more about that uh, when we get to our issues part. You can see this is our Mount Vernon team. I look forward to sharing more about our programs and especially our key program, Fairfax to Zero, which is committed to bringing Fairfax County operations and the countywide to zero emissions by 2050. Thanks. And our final panelist is Matt, who is with the Fairfax Alliance for Better Bicycling. Yeah, perfect. And hello, everyone. Thanks so much for being here with us tonight. I'm going to share a quick couple of slides here. Uh, you might notice some similarities in the slide template between mine and Sonia's, uh, as uh, Sonia also serves as the president uh, of the board of directors for FAB as well. Uh, FAB, uh, my name is Matt Roberts, uh, recently appointed as the uh, first time executive director for the organization. Very exciting time for cycling, safety, and uh, other community improvement in the region. The main focus for the Fairfax Alliance for Better Bicycling is uniting government leaders, local leaders, bike organizations, and citizens towards our common goal of making bicycling safe, accessible, and much more common throughout Fairfax County. Uh, you know, we do that in a number of ways. Um, you know, primarily we're focused on uh, activities like advising transportation plans, uh, whether that's you know, new bike pathways or new parking facilities, uh, new trails that are being expanded, all of those types of engagements. Uh, but it, it can even get down to some of the nitty gritty things like curb cutouts for when you go from a sidewalk or a trail uh, to the roadway level to help make sure you don't catch your pedals as you're going down. Uh, those types of improvements and, and those types of advising uh, are some of our direct engagement plans. Uh, we also work with supporters and volunteers to engage elected officials, uh, be present and voice support at community meetings, um, and otherwise get directly engaged uh, with leaders as well. Bicycle education and outreach, uh, you know, that can be everything from helping people get more comfortable on two wheels uh, to getting used to getting your bike up and down off the bus uh, and some of the other infrastructure that we have in the region. So that can take a lot of different forms, but we do offer workshops and different educational opportunities for our board members and, and different uh, supporters and volunteers. Social rides, getting everyone out of the house, uh, family activities. Uh, I think once uh, once we get through this uh, current crisis, I think a lot of people are going to be antsy to get out and enjoy some of this great weather. Um, and we have a very large supporter and volunteer information network, in our blog and newsletter, and a lot of ways to stay informed and engaged. On um, I'll mention two quick uh, big things that have happened recently. Uh, one, a little less recently, but in October 2014, uh, something that continues to shape uh, decision-making today is the county bicycle masses. Um, and that lays out bicycle networks, different strategies for repaving, uh, parking infrastructure, new roadway design. What's great about this is it really just permeates all kinds of transportation and infrastructure planning. Uh, for the county and helps to ensure that 
cyclists and scooters and other types of transportation are considered uh, when we're making these important design changes. And FAB has been instrumental in helping shape that. Um, in addition, uh, something that uh, FAB really did bring about and, and was key to making it happen is the 66 parallel trail, or the I-66 parallel trail outside of the Beltway. It's going to be about 22 miles of trail, uh, of course, my typo there, uh, right next to the I-66. Um, and uh, that's, uh, you know, originally was not intended or wasn't uh, considered part of the design. And through our advocacy efforts, working with planners, we were able to bring this about. And this really impacts so many people. One quarter of residents in Fairfax County are going to be within one mile of the trail. Uh, and not only does it have uh, the trail itself, but there's also a number of infrastructure improvements for crossings for I-66, uh, including different bridge crossings throughout the region that are going to include uh, sidewalks, bike lanes, and other safety uh, measures. So these are the types of things we work on. We're community-powered and volunteer-led, and uh, really appreciate the chance to come and share some of these ideas with everyone tonight. Thank you very much. Great. So we uh, now have some questions that we'd like to uh, get our panelists to get more into these issues. So I'm going to go back to Sonia. So the first question for Sonia is, what is a big conservation issue or challenge for Northern Virginia that your organization is addressing? Thank you. Yeah, um, I would say that one of the biggest issues that we're facing is climate. Um, it's a major issue that we're working on in Northern Virginia. You know, I think we all recognize that Northern Virginia is choked in traffic, yet we keep building more road capacity, failing to recognize that the new lanes will inevitably fill back up with traffic. Um, and we're just sort of kicking the problem down the road, literally, and not moving us towards a more sustainable future. And given that transportation is the number one source of greenhouse gas, we need a fundamental shift uh, in land use, transportation, housing, and energy policies towards walkable, mixed-use, mixed-income, transit-oriented communities. We really need 21st century solutions if we're going to turn this around. So let's stop investing in road expansion and prioritize that funding towards better public transportation that's Buses that are more frequent, reliable, and affordable. We need safer streets for people to walk, bike, and have safe access to that public transit to get to the places they need to go to without having to drive. And we need more housing, particularly affordable housing options that are near transit and closer to where the jobs are. You know, we really start to see how instrumental and interconnected all of these things are. When we don't have affordable housing, close to the jobs, they get pushed further and further out. And it requires more driving and more traffic and more congestion and more carbon emissions. So we really need to change this around. And that is our priority here in Northern Virginia is to really work with the leaders to, to make that fundamental shift. So they start heading in the right direction and, and we can make the sustainable community that we want for Northern Virginia. Thank you. Okay. so. Same question for Rebecca for the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions. What is a big conservation issue that you're addressing? Well, this issue is so big that I am going to uh, share a, a screen with you to talk about it. <laughs> and uh, we are addressing the whole enchilada, climate change, carbon greenhouse gases in Fairfax County. And our program is called Fairfax to Zero. And we have two basic goals. We start with county operations and the Fairfax County Public School System. And the goal is to get carbon neutral by 2030 in just 10 years. And we've been working with the county on climate solutions since 2013, like I told you. And there's been a lot of um, talk about how we're making progress. There have been small goals along the way. And what really changed in 2019 was a comprehensive planning program to reach these goals. And so part of that was an upgrade on the county operations energy strategy. And uh, the next part is how is the county residents, how are we gonna reach 
carbon neutrality, and that's by 2050. So again, just in 2019, just last year, we worked with the Board of Supervisors, along with a lot of other partners, but uh, in particular the Sierra Club, and helped get a structure in place for countywide planning. So now there's a new department, the countywide um, that coordinates all this. There used to be just three staff people spread out over all the county operations. Now there's a whole uh, program. And we've started a planning process. And it's called the Countywide Energy and Climate Action Plan process. And our goal is to make sure that this process is equitable and accountable. And it consists of task force and focus groups. And it's a big process that you can get, that people on the task force and focus group are already chosen. But if you go to the county website, all of that is public information. So you can follow along and send in your uh, comments. Some of the other big things that we worked on uh, last year was to get solar approved for 113 county buildings, including eight schools. And another county program called CPACE is uh, an acronym for an innovative financing tool for non-residential buildings to get their own, uh, put on solar and energy efficiency upgrades. So those are some big things that are in progress and some big wins that we had in 2019. Thank you. Um, Matt, uh, can you please share the big conservation issue or challenges for Northern Virginia from the perspective of your organization? Yeah, absolutely. I think I have uh, a very straightforward one as you know, we are primarily focused on bicycling and the impact that uh, getting more people out of their cars, more people on two wheels, uh, biking to school, work, biking to church, uh, you know, for groceries, for errands, uh, you know, helping people be able to make that decision helped lower uh, their carbon output, uh, you know, and eliminate things outside of carbon emissions as well. Uh, there's dust from brake pads in cars uh, that is just being kind of pelted upon us as we walk through uh, and near our roads. Um, you know, a lot of low level emissions and health impacts. So it's very clear that ensuring there are good alternatives uh, that complement and support a very strong public transit system is really critical for the region. Um, now, we do that through a number of ways, but it is kind of built in and sort of hard baked into what we do. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, building on what Sonia said earlier, um, you know, we are all paying for this infrastructure, whether we use it or not. Uh, and so when we make these gigantic investments in more roads, expanded lanes, without necessarily making the complementary investments uh, or probably even the better alternative investments uh, in things like infrastructure for bikes and public transit. We're all paying for it. Not that many of us are using it. Uh, and um, uh, we wanna make sure that we're focusing on where we should instead, which is on how do we enable people to make better decisions about how they get around uh, and lower their carbon emissions. Great, so I think we have a poll, so I'm gonna turn it over to Eliza to share the poll. Attendees, you should see these questions. Um, how are you handling being more homebound? Let us know how you're doing. We just recognize that this is a strange time for everyone and uh, take a moment and let us know how you're feeling. Okay, I'm gonna end that polling share the results you should all be able to see that in this crowd i'm not that surprised a lot of people are going for walks outside in nature when they can that's wonderful uh, a few people are going into work a few only a few people are being driven bananas people are keeping in better touch but we have some and, and most a lot of people are feeling positive but some people are definitely worried and that's that's real Okay, so I'm going to close the poll. Thank you all for sharing, checking in with us, checking in with yourselves. And um, Eleanor, back to you. Great. Um, so in our environmental community, working together and forming partnerships is integral. So we wanted to hear from a few panelists talking about that. So I'd like to start with Renee. Uh, can you describe how working in conjunction with other partner organ organizations has helped further your own organization's mission? Absolutely, thanks. Uh, you know, 
the region that we serve is really big and we have limited capacity in Northern Virginia. So the strategies that we use to pick where we invest, where we work is based on a lot of different influencers. It's our mission, our strategic plan, funding, opportunities and needs, but also community partner and, uh, interests and opportunities to partner with people. So I've worked with every organization here uh, that we have on our panel. And I'm also worked with many of the green organizations that have registered for this webinar uh, that I think are most of them are here, including the Sierra Club and Friends of Akatink Creek, the new Friends of Homes Run that popped up to help do the same kind of advocacy in the green space of Maryfield area with that comp plan amendment, uh, green Muslims, as well as Plant Nova Natives, just to name a few. Uh, I'm sorry if I missed anybody who's also on the call. Um, as I started in this position, I was able to join calls with two broader organizations that really helped me get up to speed on what the regional issues were. And that was the Virginia Conservation Network, which is an amazing resource, particularly as you're going through General Assembly and you wanna follow different bills, they can help surface uh, what are the interesting things to look at from a conservation standpoint, and also the Choose Clean Water Coalition. But then as I think about the work that we are already involved in prior to my joining, uh, locally down in the Alexandria area with the Richmond and Bark Highway Project, you know, I think about getting to know the community in which I'd be working, which is absolutely key to our mission and partnering with organizations help me connect with the people who were living there to do that. Um, one example of that is last April, we were a part of, ANS was a part of uh, helping to run the Hibola Valley Gum Springs Community Listening Session. And this was a session that brought together more than 120 community members and gave residents the opportunity to share their vision for the future of the Richmond Highway Corridor. And the forum was organized and run by a myriad of partners. ANS had a small part, um, but it was run by Good Shepherd Housing and Family Services, uh, Islamic Center of Northern Virginia, uh, ICNA uh, Mazhid, uh, Fairfax County, NAACP, New Hope Housing, South County Task Force, United Community, Zero Model Nova, and Nova Affordable Housing Association. And you know, I list out those organizations because they're not the typical organizations you might think of when you think of partnering with, with a, an environmental organization. But I think that you know, um, we look at these large scale issues of climate change and that the issues that we're dealing with are very intersectional and having partnerships that highlight the value of the variety of perspectives that we need to bring to the table in terms of tackling those big issues is just key. Um, so that's one way that uh, partners has really helped be valuable. Great, so uh, we have Bridget here who represents a statewide organization, our only statewide organization. So Bridget, can you address the same question, how you partner with other organizations to fulfill your mission in Northern Virginia, as well as any other perspectives from your organization? Definitely. So um, for us, like you said, we are statewide, so it makes it a little bit different. Um, for our organization, like I was saying earlier, we have one organizer that um, primarily works out of the Richmond area, and then I live in the Fredericksburg area and have to cover, you know, all the land from up to Loudoun County, all the way over to Arlington, Fairfax, and everything in between. So partnerships definitely play a large role in everything that we do um, in a ton of ways. So um, as I said, since, I, since I'm not able to be on the ground everywhere, um, I need to know what's going on in different local communities and what they face. And so by communicating with partners, that allows me to be able to stay up to date on what's going on on a more local level and then also what's needed in different areas around Virginia. Um, so we're able to learn what concerns the actual communities and then also how we can best assist with their efforts. So many times a lot of groups in those areas are already doing a lot of awesome work. And so a lot of it comes into play as in like, how can we assist where that work is already being done? So like with working with um, even these groups right here, it's just trying to fill in the gaps and see where we can assist, whether that be through tabling at their events, um, partnering for events, um, doing outreach for people's events, um, going and helping with petitioning. Um, it just kind of varies what the different needs are, just seeing how we can support and where we can come into play in different areas. Um, so yeah, we, we try to you know help celebrate everyone else's wins because in each area throughout Virginia, there's just a lot of different things going on on a local level and some places are ahead of others, such as Arlington is definitely ahead of you know, where Fredericksburg was. And now that I've been working in Fredericksburg with other local groups, we've seen a lot of great work there with moving towards 100% clean energy. So just kind of varies area to area. Great, thank you. 
Uh, so Sonia, you have coalition in your organization's name. So can you talk about how your organization partners and that helps you further your organization's mission? Unmute myself first, that's helpful. <laughs> uh, yes, coalition, I, you know, I think uh, for starters, we were formed um, by a group of leading conservation groups in 1997 because the issues that we face, there's so many different issues and they're so interrelated um, smart growth issues. And I listed them off, whether it's biking, walking and transit or affordable housing, safer streets, um, that it's, it works better. It, it's more prog uh, productive when we work together. Uh, so we work with a diverse coalition of partners, including the conservation, like I said, transit, bike, walk organization, affordable housing, and social equity groups. Renee has already listed off a significant number of them that we too work. Um, I think there are so many great organizations already on the ground doing work locally in, um, in Fairfax and in other places around Northern Virginia that when we pull our resources and we work together, you know, I, I think a few different things can happen where we can better understand each other's perspectives and what's going on in, in their line of work um, so that it educates us, you know, environmentalists might not necessarily know or be working or focused on what some of the affordable housing issues might be. And so having a place where we can talk and learn from one each other is really helpful. Um, and we're better able to formulate more of a common message because at the end of the day, we all want healthier, sustainable communities that are equitable and accessible to all, everybody, all income brackets. Everybody should live in a vibrant community. And that is what we're trying to create. And we need to work together uh, to make that happen. Um, one example of all of us coming together um, is the Fairfax Healthy Communities Coalition that most of us on uh, this panel are included in. Um, there's a number of us, Faith Alliance, Northern Virginia Affordable Housing Alliance, Audubon, Fairfax Alliance for Better Bicycling, the Sierra Club, Friends of Akatink, Friends of Homes Run, and, and so many more. And, you know, and it, it becomes challenging when you want to list them all off because everybody does such great work and you don't want to forget anybody. But together, you know, the Fairfax Healthy Communities, we were able to put together a shared platform that helped to educate the new board of supervisors in Fairfax to really better understand and help accelerate the issues that we're working on. And we worked together on that Merrifield Comp Plan Amendment so that we could really help to shape um, the forest preservation, the conservation, the stormwater improvements, the bike ped trail improvements that were incorporated into this so that we're actively creating the communities we want. And the same coalition of folks are working in that Route 1. Coalition for Smarter Growth has been active through the development of the Embark Richmond Highway Plan that sets a vision for walkable, bikeable, transit-oriented communities. It's gonna be the first bus rapid transit system that we have in the county, and it's super exciting. But this takes you know, a combined effort of all of our resources together so that we can make these things happen and continue to follow them as the redevelopment occurs to make sure we're holding them to task, to make sure that they're keeping their word on um, building things out the way that the vision is calling for. And so when we are able to partner together, we just speak collectively and we have a stronger voice together. It's really important. Great, thank you. We're gonna move on to a new question. Um, 2020 was a very exciting and historic year in Richmond. Um, so we wanna um, have some, uh, let's make these rapid fire um, responses from some of our panelists on what did your organization see as the biggest wins from the General Assembly session? And for this one, I would like to start with Rebecca um, for, from the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions. Great, thank you very much. So as you know, I said that we focus on county legislation, but there was some state level legislation that was very important to the county. And that was a, two, a collection of bills called the Solar Freedom Bill. And this bill was passed and I'm gonna show you, there's some key points to it that are, are really very interesting. So 
one of our one of our great successes was that the county agreed to have install solar on 113 buildings. Well, there's only one problem with that. The total amount of energy, distributed energy that could be generated in the state was 1% of the total. And the county, if we went through with that, would have been way over that cap. So it was very important to pass the first part of solar freedom and it increased that cap from 1% to 6%. So yay, we're in. The next thing is, if you had wanted to put solar panels on your own home, you could only put enough solar panels on to generate the same amount of energy you used last year. So if you wanted to get an electric car, install a hot tub, whatever, you were capped at that. So now, with under the Solar Freedom Bill, that cap has been raised to 150% of past use. And we think this will encourage people because it'll be less risky to go ahead and get your system because you know it is future proof. Another big win was allowing landlords to install solar and charge tenants for the electricity. Because before this, there was no, it, it, that was considered selling electricity and landlords weren't allowed to do that. So this really opens up the field for renters and apartment buildings. And the final one uh, is that the Fairfax County has been wanting to put a big solar array over on the Lorton landfill, a great use for that space. And uh, that would not have been allowed the way the laws were written uh, because the energy was being uh, generated in a different place than it was being used. And so uh, that was fixed up in the solar freedom bills. They passed the health, House and Senate, and you can see how important that state level legislation was to our county goals. Thanks. Great, uh, Matt, uh, could you share some of uh, your perspective on what was exciting uh, wins in Richmond? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when it rains, it pours. So this year was absolutely, um, you know, a lot of successes. Um, I'll touch on some of these really briefly. Uh, I'll definitely want to mention Delegate Corey and uh, Delegate Plum. Um, this is a really big thing. When someone stops at a crosswalk, uh, it makes it illegal to pass another person stops at a crosswalk. This is, I imagine many of you have experienced this before. Uh, one person stops, the other person doesn't necessarily see the pedestrian, um, and they try and go around, and it just creates a uh, dangerous conflict uh, that this will help to alleviate, at least to some extent. Um, Senator Servell also introduced something that many advocates have been pushing for for a long time, which is a vulnerable road user bill. Uh, it changes how penalties are determined for drivers who injure or kill a vulnerable road user, which is cyclists, scooters, pedestrians, everyone not uh, in a two-ton uh, vehicle. Um, another big one, and uh, many will say about time, uh, hands-free VA, yay, that's fantastic. Uh, using your phone while driving, no longer allowed, um, and that is definitely a big win for the state. Um, some of the other ones here, uh, I don't want to delve too much into the intricacies of, but, you know, things along the lines of improving, uh, you know, automated photo speed enforcement, bicycle signage, um, clarifying rules around e-bikes. All of these are really just helping to ensure that we can make uh, cycling a bigger part of uh, how we move forward and just in general making roads safer for everyone. Uh, and this has you know, definitely been a very successful year on the legislative front and great to see so much support. Again, thanks to Delegate Corey who's joining us uh, for all of your hard work and for uh, bringing that to fruition as well. But, um, we do have a lot more info about these and other things that have happened on our website. Uh, and you can also email us with any questions. But uh, these are definitely some big wins this year. Thank you. Renee, can you share? Your perspective on the legislative session, please. Absolutely. I don't have any slides, um, but I will mention that there's been a push to join the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, REGI. And so that's really exciting that that's moving forward. Um, the Virginia Clean Economy Act, which on a webinar today with Coalition for Smarter Growth and others, they talked about the Virginia Clean Economy Act being the seventh state uh, to go to zero carbon by mid century, which is just a huge win. Um, but then also, uh, more locally, I really love the bill uh, SB 11, which was a disposable bag bill. Because we're a dealing rule state and localities sometimes can't make their own rules, this bill allows localities to charge a five cent fee for disposable bags. And so localities will be able to choose to enact this or not. 
um, and also the wildlife uh, corridor bill, which is a bill that will help uh, prioritize projects based in science that will aid in the protection of wildlife, enhancement of connectivity for Virginia's wildlife, and provide increased road safety for the people of Virginia. Um, and it also ensures that VDOT considers the impact of road projects on increased wildlife vehicle collisions and disruption to wildlife corridors. So that's really exciting. Um, but maybe um, most exciting because I think it's so new is a slew of environmental justice and equity bills. Uh, the Virginia Environmental Justice Collaborative defines environmental justice, if it's not a term you're familiar with, with the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to development, implementation, and enforcement of laws, regulations, and policies, and that no group of person, people shall bear a disproportionate share of the negative environmental consequences resulting from those environmental decisions. There are a slew of them. We have a blog post about it, which we'll share with you later. Um, but one of the examples is the establishment of a permanent Virginia Council on Environmental Justice. So that's really exciting as well. Thank you. Uh, Bridget, do you want to wrap it up and see if anything hasn't been uh, mess mentioned about the legislative session that you can share? Yeah, um, we definitely touched on a few of them, but let me go ahead and share my screen again. Flashback to my PowerPoint that I had. Um, so a few wins that we focused on from the last session that have been really awesome, like Renee just mentioned, the Virginia Clean Economy Act. So that essentially moves Virginia to the same level as California and before. It's like we were nowhere near that realm, which is really awesome. So we will actually um, be moving to renewable energy by 2045. Um, that shuts most polluting plants down by 2030. There's a few small exceptions to that. Um, it also has aggressive efficiency standards, and um, there were also some bills put forth that help to protect um, low-income households so that they aren't allowed to spend a certain amount of their income on their electricity bills. Um, also, as Renee mentioned, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, and so that essentially um, does a lot to reduce our emissions while also increasing public health benefits um, and then cuts pollution, raises revenues that we will then use to invest in coastal, resili coastal resiliency and energy efficiency. Um, so that's basically a cap and trade system where um, plants will be able to sell their excess um, allowances and so other plants will buy them off and so it overall will reduce these allowances per year and so then um, essentially all the pollution rates will slowly decrease then we'll be using the revenue as i said for more energy efficiency so it's kind of just a full circle effect um, in addition to that there was a fracking ban that um, now essentially covers most of eastern virginia which is um, on the potomac aquifer and um, also an offshore drilling ban for virginia's coast which is really awesome Great. Uh, I think thanks to everybody's great work here and on our um, in the participants. I think it was a, a very exciting and momentous time, and it's going to be even better next year. So, uh, so we have a poll. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Eliza. Indeed. Hello. Hello. Okay. So, I hope everybody will tell me if you can see the poll. So we're asking everyone to vote. What is your highest sustainability concern for Northern Virginia? And this will help us sort through some of the many questions that have come in as well. So please pick no more than three. Let me get on video so you can really see me. Please pick no more than three. Even though technically you could pick more, please stick to three so that we actually get a sense of priorities here. And thank you, everyone. All right, and three, two, one. Okay, I'm ending the poll. Thank you all, and now you should be able to see the results. You can see that at the last minute, habitat loss pulled it out. Uh, prior to that, our, some of our transportation questions were ahead, but I, I see um, really strong interest in habitat and green space, access to nature, um, alongside a lot of our transportation questions. Um, we're sort of up high, then we have energy, and um, the bottom of the list, a little less interest in this particular crowd tonight in air quality and stormwater management or water quality. Uh, but of course, those things are tied up in everything else. So panelists, have you had a chance to digest those results? All right, I'm gonna stop sharing and give it back to Eleanor. And I will also make it gallery view so that you should now, everyone should be able to see all the panelists pretty evenly as you answer your questions. And I will go away again. Thank you all. Well, thanks. 
everybody for all the amazing questions. Um, again, if we don't address your question, we will follow up and um, after the event and email. But I'm going to start with a question for Renee. Uh, so we have um, a lot of um, input from big landscape who are using pesticides, lawn chemicals, and gas powered mowers and blowers. Do you have ideas on how we can convince our neighbors to stop these unhealthy practices? That's a really good question and a really hard one. I think um, we've been partnering a lot with Plant Nova Natives and running some HOA symposiums, so geared specifically towards homeowners associations, because I think those are organizations where you can make a lot of big impact if you can uh, influence how they perform land management, so in their mowing or their you know, taking care of their leaves. And so um, it's a really hard nut to crack. We've talked to a lot of people in HOAs, talked about their boards, their management companies, talking about working with the landscapers. Um, but I think some of the you know, education and outreach that we're doing and that everyone can do individually can really help with that. Um, Plant Nova Natives has been key too in working with um, nurseries and labeling like uh, locally native, native plants, which can be helpful in terms of sustainable landscaping techniques, but in terms of land management, um, other organizations too have been really key in, um, in working with like understanding how pesticides affect your lawns and, and uh, educating HOAs in helping to really build sustainable management plans that can be implemented at a large scale. Um, obviously that can happen at a small scale as well with resources like the extension offices as well. Did anyone else want to chime in as well for that question? Oh yeah, Does anybody else? Raise your hand, I think I can then call on you. Yeah, actually, uh, this is Matt. Um, I'll add one thing to that, which I think uh, was a great point uh, that Renee brought up, which is how much power is at the level of the HOA and at the community group. You know, that really is a place where you can have a lot of impact in your own community. I'm sure many of you are aware of that, but um, you know, that is also a place where a lot of roadblocks can be put in. HOAs have done things like fighting solar power and allowing people to put solar panels on their house. And, you know, that that can be a roadblock and an opportunity. So obviously engagement is key and, and speaking up and making sure people are aware uh, of your positions and wanting to see those changes. You can have a, a great direct impact locally. Anybody else? I would say always leading by example can be really helpful. You can lead by a compassionate, uh, good example of what you can do with the alternatives that you're telling people about. That can that can be really motivating. Good point. All right, I'm going to move to another question about uh, growth and smart growth uh, for Sonia. Uh, so the Silver Line corridor from Spring Hill to McLean del deliberately did not put parking garages in their stations because the end game is to un sprawl Tyson's Corner. What is being done to encourage people to take the silver line rather than drive? I would say um, by not having easily accessible parking, that in its own right encourages people to find a different way uh, to get to those metro stations. There's capital bike share, um, I know that they are working hard, the county is, um, maybe not fast enough to improve um, the safety and ability for people to walk and cross some of these larger roads and arterials um, that are in Tyson's and to make it more bikeable. Um, I think Tyson's, because it's sort of reinventing itself um, and it has set such a lofty vision, um, from where it was to where it wants to be is in transition. So there's a lot of challenges as you know, each segment sort of redevelops and opens. And with so much more housing coming online in those areas, like the borough just opened up where everybody who moves into those areas are within walking distance to the Greensboro Metro. And so a lot of the new housing is gonna be right near the metro stations and they've got this beautiful new Whole Foods and these other grocery stores and activities that are opening up there. And that's where you start to see the ability um, to walk more places and not have to get into your car. Um, and so by limiting the parking, it, it, it encourages folks to find other ways and also needing to ensure the county um, and VDOT need to ensure that those other modes are viable. 
And that's where we talk about making sure the buses are a viable option for people, that biking and walking are safe and viable. If there are missing sidewalk connections, people aren't gonna be able to walk there. Um, and so it's really critical to make sure that these things are all connected as part of these redevelopments to ensure the walkability, bikeability to these metro stations. And that buses are connecting. There are bus routes that connect to the McLean metro station. So neighborhoods can access a bus that brings them to directly um, to the metro station. And then sometimes it's just learning new behaviors. If you're used to driving places and now it's not as accessible to drive, it takes sort of stepping outside of perhaps your comfort zone and better understanding what are the routes. So maybe education, the county can provide better education and I think they do through um, like their commuter services department um, to educate folks on how the other mode options that they can take. Um, I think that answers the question to some degree, most degree. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna keep it moving and just get to more questions. Um, so Bridget, um, as everybody knows, we're in the middle of a public health crisis, but yet it seems that the topic of health is really missing from our climate and environmental group programs. Do you think bringing public health issues into higher visibility and inclusion into our advocacy advocacy is important? Um, yes, I would say that in relation to health and climate, we try to, what we have done in the past is really focusing on, you know, how air pollution affects people's health and how we need clean water, we need clean air, we need better transportation systems to lower our emissions so people can breathe better. So um, changing our vehicles to electric so kids don't have asthma and we relate all of those things to climate, but um, with where we are right now, in the middle of this pandemic. I think um, a little bit of what we have been doing is, is trying to, we haven't really been trying to grab the story and make it, oh, emissions have fallen because people can't go outside because we don't necessarily want to use that as like, oh, you know, emissions have fallen because everyone is inside due to a global health pandemic. We don't necessarily want to praise that as a reason because um, it kind of relates back to then environmental things keep people from, you know, spending money and supporting the economy and all those sorts of things. So that's one reason that I've heard at least about why organizations have been a bit hesitant to, to use that as a, an environmental push. But on the other side, then a lot of people have been doing good things about taking this opportunity and using it to get outside. Like we just had in the poll, that is a way that a lot of people have been kind of trying to seek a space for themselves to kind of get away from everything. So people have been taking a little bit of an advantage to take this time to connect with nature, just spend some time outside, take a walk. And so I think that that's a great way for people to be using this time. Um, in addition to that, while um, social media generally keeps people on their couch and keeps people inside, I think that supporting those sorts of things, um, being outside and using this time to do a little bit more engagement with the environment could also be done through social media. So having more people showing their support um, on Facebook or on Instagram, um, just posting pictures of that. And then um, another way that we could kind of be using this um, to the advantage, the only few advantages that this could give us is spending this time and, you know, reaching out and um, showing support for different environmental issues that we do have in our communities. So while people are tied to their couches, um, they could be trying to think about writing a letter to the editor or maybe making a phone call to a local official to thank them for bills that they voted on. So those are just a, a few ways that we could try and use this time inside to do some more advocacy. Anybody want to chime in on a local perspective about tying health and environmental issues together? Wait, raise your hand, Sonia. Yeah, I wouldn't mind touching on that a little bit because we've been sort of having similar conversations. Um, you know, I, I do think that the current situation really um, brings to light the need uh, to support our most vulnerable and ensure that our communities are healthy, right? That everyone has access to a home and that gets to affordability and, and our vulnerable folks, you know, need to have a home to shelter in. They need to have access to food. Um, you see this great outpouring from the schools to ensure that students are getting food. Well, that's really critical to make sure that our 
our communities are healthy um, and that we need access to the outdoors for our mental stability, for exercise. And, you know, and I've been finding in my neighborhood in Falls Church um, that even though people are social, di um, physically distancing, I've, I've been told to change that phrase, like we're not socially distancing because we actually want to be social, we're distancing ourselves physically. But I'm able to say hello to my neighbors and check in with them and see, hey, you know, do you need anything? Um, and, and that connecting as a community um, really is important because I think we just start to recognize um, that we're sort of all in this together. Um, and, and at the very least, our most vulnerable need help and support. And so it's really important that we think about how we create these spaces for people and how we provide that support. Uh, and on a separate note with regards to sort of the air pollution and, and the idea of, okay, we're all staying home. You know, I, I find it quite remarkable at what happens to our air quality when people start dro stop driving. And while I understand we're sort of being forced to do that, the whole circumstance sort of shows how environmentally damaging the automobile is to our environment. And if we could find more sustainable ways to get around, like walking, like biking, and, and public transportation, when you know all things are said and done and we've moved past where we can actually get on buses and trains together again, but that if we can move in a way that isn't in our individual cars that are spewing pollutants, um, we can actually see how much better our environment can be and how healthier it can be. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Rebecca. I know uh, the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions focuses a lot on energy efficiency. So can you talk about um, how we can address um, the fact that buildings are the largest consumer of energy and producers of greenhouse gases? And what do you know of that's being proposed to educate homeowners on this topic so that they can make a difference to fight global warming? Well, we are lucky that uh, there's been expanded funding for what's called the Energy Masters Program. And this is a program that specifically trains volunteer groups to go out to low income housing and do the work of installing weather stripping and small energy upgrades, energy efficiency upgrades like that. And part of the uh, outreach for that program raises everybody's awareness about what needs to be done. So if you become a volunteer, obviously you're learning what you could also do in your own home. Our hope for uh, the budget this year was to expand that program to fund, uh, to, to provide funding through community organizations like FACS or some of your organizations, because we have direct connections to the communities in need. And so we would be in a really good position to uh, magnify that program and, and continue to spread it out. And you also see that in the county planning, in their operations plan and in the CCAP, which is gonna be the community-wide plan that'll go out into the public, that that issue is going to be addressed and uh, we just haven't gotten to that part of the planning yet. So it is really big and buildings are uh, certainly huge and efficiency is a, a top way. It's, it's the easiest and least sexy way to, um, to decrease our greenhouse gases. And so thank you very much for that question because it is very important. I just want to call out that Eco Action Arlington, I believe it was the initiator of the um, Energy Masters program. Is that correct, Eleanor? Yeah, I was going to thank you. We're really excited Energy Masters is going to our second community and hopefully statewide someday. So thank you. All right, here's a, um, a topic that can be controversial for a lot of folks. Um, and I'll just see if somebody can raise their hand to address this one. Um, so cats are the top source of direct human caused bird mortality. Um, so what can your organization do to help solve this issue and conserve our Northern Virginia biodiversity? Who wants to take that one? Renee or I pick on you? 
cats are, you know, I'm, I used to be a cat owner. I'm a dog owner now, but I used to be a cat owner. I understand cats. I love cats. Um, but outside is just not a place for cats. But it's really a social change that needs to happen, which really is a lot of what we've been talking about with other issues as well in terms of um, the way you manage your property as a homeowner or HOA. And to have that social change to shift, to be able to educate people on truly what the impacts are, is going to take, again, a lot of compassion and a lot of work at it. Um, the laws locally and statewide treat dogs and cats differently. If you think about um, allowing to have dogs be running around anywhere like cats can today, it's, it's a really interesting mindset about really the kind of impacts that cats have in a way that we just don't think of other pets. Um, so I, I think that's just a matter of a, a lot of education and working with locales, speaking up at public hearings. Um, I know the Environmental Quality Advisory Council has opportunities to speak on issues that matter to people, be an issue that's brought up um, or any other opportunities you might see fit. Thank you. Um, Matt, um, we've got a question um, that really kind of brings up the issues of when we have to make choices. Uh, so why are we still promoting bike paths that mow down trees and forest as an environmental benefit. So can you speak a little bit to kind of the choices we have to make when we uh, build bike paths and that takes away the trees that would be kind of getting rid of some of that um, heat, heat. And uh, the specific example that was brought up is can we make uh, people friendly greenways like the phase one of the Clintonville neighborhood greenway? And I saw that one in the questions. I wasn't uh, specifically familiar with that phase one. So I apologize. I can't comment on that part. But more broadly, when we're talking about cycling infrastructure and other infrastructure, uh, one of the biggest things that prevents these from going in is right of way. So where you'll actually see a lot of these systems going in is how the WOMP trail was made. You know, that's an old rail trail. Um, and then it also has the right of way of some of the electrical equipment there. So that area was already cleared. There were already, uh, you know, that was already kind of open, empty space that then was repurposed for this. So a lot of focus really is on how can we take existing right of way, um, whether that be utilities, uh, railway, uh, other, um, you know, infrastructure that could, uh, you know, the I-66 uh, uh, expansion that's going to happen. Um, you know, that, that uh, exists and we want to use that space better. Uh, to include more options for site. So, um, you know, that's one way to look at it. Now, that doesn't mean that every time it's going to be a brownfield site or it's going to be uh, right away perfectly aligned like that. Um, that is the ideal for a lot of these. I think the other part of that person's question uh, alluded to, let's take back space. And yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm all open for that conversation. Uh, you know, it is not, we do not lack for space in our cities. Uh, we have just allocated it in ways that don't allow for uh, greater pedestrian safety, greater cycling access, and some of these things. So when we're talking about things like parking minimum, uh, that's a very outdated policy model that uh, I think many folks would agree needs to be updated or even eliminated in some places. Um, you know, how can we ensure uh, that um, uh, you know, we're able to use the space we have better uh, and make that possible, uh, make better cycling and, and uh, otherwise get around infrastructure problems. So I wholeheartedly agree with the question and I um, uh, think that is, uh, you know, if we don't have right away, let's use space that we've already allocated for cars or other things. Thank you. Um, so here's a question I'm going to open up to the group. I think we're all frustrated by the stores that blast the air conditioner all summer. So what can we do to get this on the agenda? It's a clear waste of energy. Um, anybody have any thoughts? So I'll actually ask one thing. I'm, I'm wearing my, my bike hat today, but I've also worked in the energy sector a bit. One thing that I'll throw out there is there are some amazing things that can be done around rate design, time of use rates, uh, different ways for electricity to be valued so that it will discourage commercial properties and retail outlets from using energy in this way. So aside from efficiency and setting standards that say close your doors and you can't have a open while you're running air conditioning, um, we can also use the power of the purse and have the utilities implement programs that will help address this. That's one way 
uh, that we can, um, or one idea that we can push for to help eliminate some of that waste. I would also chime in to say, I'm wondering what will change as the Virginia Clean Economy Act gets enacted, because that's going to drive us more to renewables. And in order to have renewables, you're going to have a need to have energy efficiency. You just can't get there without that. And so I think we'll see a lot of changes coming in the coming years. Last question, I think. Um, so I'll throw this open to the panel. So a retired nurse is particularly interested in clean water, safe access to food, and appropriate sewage capacities. So how is Fairfax honoring these uh, safety measures while also seeking growth and tax income? Apparently a great question and you've yeah. stumped the panel. <laughs> All right, we've stumped the panel. All right, well, I'll try another one. Well, so we'll try to follow up on that one. Apologies, you stumped the panel. That's a prize, I think. Um, so can anybody speak to what, what we're hoping is some good news? We've um, the last few weeks with people being more homebound, does anybody know about um, data, local, state, national, or global emissions data that shows decrease in global emissions? Uh, um, been, I uh, think so. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, jumping in there. Um, I was gonna say, I think Sonia covered a good amount of it earlier, as in there's definitely a lot of awesome things with emissions falling. I've seen in China that CO2 emissions have dropped a ton. Also in New York City, I think that um, they were doing a study and saw that from last month at this time compared to this month at this time, I wanna say it was either a 30% drop in cars being driven or a 50% drop. So that's a, a big difference right there, but I'm not sure about the details and um, some other things. I know that in Italy, there's been a ton of social media being shared about how the waters there have been a lot cleaner than they have been in the past. So there's definitely some some good light being um, shined upon the, the positives in this situation, but I'm sure there's a lot of other local things that people have been seeing also. I would also just highlight that, that I think we did touch on this a little bit, but this is all coming in the face of a lot of pain for a lot of people. And so it's interesting to be able to see what the world could be if we do things like Sonia had highlighted earlier, like change the way we do transportation and such. Um, but to be sensitive that, that this is not really a realistic expectation in our current society today and that we're going to need to make lots of changes to get there, but also still allow people to thrive in a healthy environment. All right, I think we're doing another poll. Is that right, Eliza? No? Okay. Hi, everybody. Let me get you my video back again so you remember who I am. Um, we're going on to our last poll, and this is really starting to get to the, the wrap up with a huge thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, I want to say a particular thank you to Eleanor for being an incredible moderator and managing our time and space. And, um, and thank you to all you panelists for joining us today. Um, and I know there are so many other experts in the audience among the attendees. So, you know, I think we'll be online for a while and we can, we can do things like this again and we can use this kind of space to continue these types of discussions. Um, you know, in an odd way, maybe we'll come together more uh, because of this. Um, so anyway, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and launch the last poll and this is, um, a wrap up question for all of our attendees. I hope everyone can see it. Because of this webinar, what do you think you're likely to get more involved in during the coming year? Uh, and I, I don't know if this is a multiple choice question or not. Um, what is the most likely thing you're going to do as a result of this webinar? All right, and three, two, one. Thank you all. Now we did intend for that to be a multiple choice and let you vote for a couple. So we'll have to um, just assume that the top few represent people's um, uh, where you'd like to go. And it looks like we are seeing um, a lot of interest on advocacy around local environmental issues, state environmental issues, and getting involved with an advocacy organization. And I know I speak for ANS um, and I probably speak for these other organizations that um, you can advocate with us. We can train you and we can help you get started and you can join us in the issues that are our priorities, but you can also feel empowered to do more advocacy on your own. 
um, as a result of working with us and learning, um, learning from us and teaching us. There's so much to learn from these incredibly powerful volunteer advocates throughout the community. Um, so I think with that, I don't know if Eleanor or anyone else wants to give a wrap up, but I'm gonna close the poll here and turn it back over to the panelists. Great, so we do have a final question. We wanted to make sure everybody left here with more ideas about what you can do. So this is gonna be really rapid fire, but I'm gonna to go to each organization and uh, please share real tangible things people can do right now to make a positive impact on our environment. So Sonia. Okay, well, you know, I was working through this. It, I think if we're going to have an impact on climate, we need to start making sustainable choices in our day-to-day -day life. Um, we talked about how do we share with our neighbors. Um, sometimes it's just by doing what you know is right. And so I was going to suggest try replacing a car trip with biking and walking. Um, and when this crisis is behind us, explore ways of using transit without using your car to get to it. Um, look at bus routes, bike and walk to Metro or bike to the store. And public transportation is going to need our help and support after this more now than ever. It's, it's in crisis, as a lot of stuff is. Um, so please be sure to speak up, making these options better. We have a Butter Buses campaign petition that we would love for folks to sign on to so that we can really speak loudly that we need better sustainable transportation. We need safer streets. Um, so come to our website, follow us on uh, on our social media at Better DC Region. Um, sign up for our email alerts, and then that way we can keep you informed and part of the conversation and help you to get engaged and speaking up locally, because that's critical. Thank you. Renee, same question. Tangible things people can do right now. Sure. So in uh, our winter edition of our Naturalist Quarterly, we had a spot on uh, seven actions for seven generations. And that comes from the tradition of Native peoples. Some Native nations have said that seven generations means thinking about your impact on, seven, on the seven generations that will follow you. So I will send around that link later. It's ans anshome.org slash climate, but there's some great actionable things you can do there. Um, but two other quick things I would say is one, Think about the power of small multiples. Your actions absolutely make an impact and the actions of more than one person together are even that much more powerful. So think about how you can get involved at a group level. When I first started thinking about invasive plant removals, as an example, I started leading in Fairfax County and as an IMA site leader. And one day we had a group of people who together with me ripped out 30 trash bags full of garlic mustard and an invasive plant. And I remember thinking, I never could have done that alone. So the impact and scale you can do when you lead initiatives yourself can be so powerful. Um, and then last, I would just say showing up. And some people have already talked about this already. Um, public hearings are some of the least sexy things I could possibly recommend that everybody get involved in, but they're also really powerful. Other people are showing up that have differing interests and if you can be there to raise a sustainable voice, that can really make a difference. And when you can do it with a friend, that makes an even bigger impact. Great. Thank you, Bridget. Um, I would agree with what the other panelists have said so far. But in addition to that, then I would say that really being vocal about the issues that matter to you is huge because your elected officials want to hear from you. And if you're their constituent, then they're more likely to listen to you than other people and they want to be reelected. So um, with that being said, then making sure, like Renee just said, showing up to your, elect, your local meetings, um, making sure your opinions are heard, the more people that you bring, the more they're going to listen to you, the more, they sh the more you show up, the more they're going to listen to you. So um, just making sure that you're doing your part in um, doing your own advocacy surrounding the issues that you care about. And then I would also say that partnering with your local organizations, um, the ones that you know, work in your community and just have a, a large impact and have a lot of um, connections to to those that are local in your own community just really make a big difference. So, um, you know, sign up for their meetings, go go meet the people that are working with them so that you can be a part of it because the more people that are involved, the greater effect that you're going to have. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Rebecca. Well, it is budget season in Fairfax County, the proposed or um, advertised budget has been put out. 
And two weeks ago, we at FACS had people from each district going to their budget town halls, having meetings with their district supervisors to talk about the FACS budget points, and we signed up to speak at the budget hearings. Well, now we're in a health crisis and those things are not happening, <laughs> a lot of them. And some of them are being changed to being virtual and some are being moved along down the line. And you know, and that's okay because our focus right now is on supporting the most vulnerable in our county. And it goes along with what FACS always believes, and I think we all are, about environmental justice and supporting the one Fairfax goals of not leaving any of the most vulnerable behind. And so we are fine with stepping back for a while and really encouraging people to get involved with some of the local organizations that are helping those vulnerable, from food distribution to workers advocacy, affordable housing, and we'll be sharing that on our website. But when this lifts, come back, join one of our advocacy teams, get on our mailing list, and find out when we're meeting with your district supervisor and when you can sign up to speak, or you don't have to be brave, uh, just uh, join in uh, advocating for some of our key budget points. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. And last but not least, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have a pretty straightforward one, which conveniently works uh, whether we were in the current health crisis or not, and that's get out on your bike. Uh, you know, right now is a great time to do it. Advisement from the CDC uh, and others uh, show it's a great way to get a little bit of outdoor time while maintaining social distancing. Uh, I will give a broad heads up that places like the WOND Trail, some of the more popular arterials are seeing a lot of uh, increased traffic right now. Um, and so, uh, you know, maybe take some alternative route, uh, check out some of your local quieter side streets. Um, those are great places uh, to get out and get a little exercise. Um, even if we were in this though, getting out and biking does have a snowballing effect. When your neighbors see you biking, they feel more comfortable doing it. When others see you biking, uh, they feel more comfortable. When cars see a lot of bikes in the bike paths, they're more conscious of the people that are out there. It's sort of a bit of a herd safety. The more of us there are, the more safe it can be for people. Um, so I definitely encourage you, uh, if you're a comfortable biker, uh, get out there. If you're not as comfortable, check out our website. We've got tips and pointers um, and are always uh, here to offer advice and information. So get out and pedal a little more if you can. Excellent. Um, well, in closing, it was an honor to serve uh, as the moderator of this amazing panel. Um, I think we can do our uh, applause. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, and again, uh, we really appreciate everybody being here tonight. It was a very exciting um, event and a great conversation. And do look for follow-up uh, that you'll be getting very via email with a summary of everybody's information, as well as some of the questions that we didn't get to answer. So have a wonderful evening. Thank you.